as you can see from the title of this lesson, this is a tutorial on units of measurement and scientific notation. Both of these ideas are going to help to set up one of the large ideas in this chapter, which is going to be conversions. Right? But if we're going to look at converting units to other units, we first have to learn what are the different types of units of measurements, and we have to re-familiarize ourselves with some things about scientific notations and shrinking and enlarging numbers. If we're going to talk about units of measurement, it has to begin with something called the System International, otherwise known as SI or SI units. The System International's job is to develop standards for the various measurements that we undergo when we're participating in chemistry, physics, biology labs. It's a large group of scientists whose job is to check sort of like weights and balances of things to make sure that numbers we list on the periodic table, for instance, are in fact what we think they are, that units for measuring things are very consistent worldwide so that data can be reproduced and compared and analyzed from one country to another, and most importantly, uh, to make sure that there is an open line of communication between all of the scientists in the whole wide world. In this class, we'll really focus on seven major types of measurements. Those measurements are mass, length, time, temperature, volume, and amount. Now, although up here I have many different types of units listed, those are the units that we will use, you will notice that they are all based off of one type of what we call base unit. Right? And that base unit comes from the System International. For instance, if we were looking at measuring mass, the System International says that worldwide everybody should measure mass in grams. The reason why I will list other units such as kilograms and milligrams has to do with practicality. Sometimes it is not appropriate to measure the amount of something in grams. It's not practical to say I've got 37 billion grams of something. Or it doesn't make sense to say I've got 0.000001 grams of something. And so we start to use prefixes in front of the base unit that can enlarge that number or reduce that number to put it on the scale that we want. For instance, very often if you're looking at pharmaceuticals, they won't give you dosages in grams. That would be an astronomical amount of, say, aspirin to take to cure a headache they will tell you to take two aspirin, which would be about 600 milligrams right, of aspirin to try to alleviate a headache. Similarly, when they do drug busts and the DEA right, tries to bring down cartels, they always mention people getting uh, confiscating kilos of, say, heroin or cocaine or something like that. That is still based off the gram, but there's so much of it in volume right, or in mass that the unit of gram doesn't make sense. Right? A thousand grams is a kilogram. So if I have a hundred thousand kilos, right, that's getting me into the millions of grams. So these prefixes don't really change the base unit. They just allow us to manipulate it in a fashion that we like. Mass base unit is the gram. Length we will measure in the base unit, which is meter. However, you will also see centimeters, kilometers, and millimeters, or you know, kilometers as you go through. Notice, these are all what we call metric units. Right? Metric is how the world measures things in the science capacity. Right? Only the US uses feet and inches. Right? Everywhere else uses meters to measure things. Right? So we will have to do the same in here so that we can compare the results of our experiments to other places. Time you will see measured in the base unit, which is seconds, but you'll also see it measured in hours. Temperature, notice, nowhere up here do we see Fahrenheit. Right? We will always measure in Celsius or Kelvin. Volume, the base unit is the liter, but we'll also use milliliters and cubic centimeters. And lastly, we won't touch on it much in this chapter, but very soon we will get into measuring amounts of elements and chemicals, and that will always be done in something called the mole. And so these are the different measurements that we can take, and these are the units that they will have. 
Right? That's the first big idea in terms of getting ready to control right, different measurements and then being able to convert from, say, grams to milligrams or meters to millimeters right, or seconds to hours and so on. The other thing I wanted to do to review a bit before we move on is rediscuss scientific notation. Right? If you remember scientific notation from math class, right, it's talking about taking something to a certain exponent or exponential notation. Right? The rules for scientific notation are as follows. Rule number one, if I'm going to take a number and I'm trying to turn it into scientific notation, always choose a number between one and ten. You will never see something written as 17.5 to the fifth power times 10 to the fifth, or 11.7 times 10 to the third. Right? The number will always be something between 1 and 10 whenever we do scientific notation in the class. Second rule. If we're working with a large number, Right, move the decimal place right, as many places to the right, right to get to the end of the number and will always lead to a positive exponent. So if we're working with a very large number, right, we put our decimal point in that gives us a number between 1 and 10, and then we move as many places to the right as we need to to get to the end of that number, and we will say times 10 to the positive whatever the number of places that we move towards. If it is a small number, We do the same process, except it's in reverse. Right? We move to get a number between 1 and 10, and then we move as many places to the left to reach the decimal point, leading us to a negative exponent. So if it's a decimal number, we will write a negative exponent equal to the places moved to the left to reach the decimal after we choose the number between 1 and 10. If we take a look at it, a few examples of these, right, let's take a look at 2 where we're working with a large number, right, and then 2 if we're working with a decimal. For instance, If I have the number 17,645,000, it is not practical to continue to write that number over and over and over again in a math problem because it will take up a significant amount of space. So what we do is we change it into scientific notation to make it much more manageable. Now, we're going to couple two ideas here together. Right? The first is the one we just talked about, scientific notation. The other has to do with what we've been working on earlier in the chapter, which is significant digits. Right? The number I choose between 1 and 10 must always match the number of sig figs in this number. So, the number I'm going to choose between 1 and 10 
is going to be 1.7645000 or some version of that. How I decide how many sig figs to do is I figure out how many sig figs this number has. Without a decimal point, this number has one, two, three, four, five. Right? Because if you remember, with no decimal point, these three zeros do not count. So the number I choose between 1 and 10 has to have five sig figs. So I will choose 1.764. Times 10, and then my exponent is either going to be positive or negative due to the type of number that I have. Well, sure enough, 17645000 is a very large number, so I'm going to have a positive exponent equal to the places moved to the right to reach the end of the number. So here is where I put my decimal, so I count how many places to the right I had to go, and it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I would write this number as 1.7645 times 10 to the 7. Looking at another example. If I took a different number, right, for instance, let's take... The number 2200000000, right, which is 220 billion. Now, up here, you could say, well, it didn't save me a whole lot of space by writing this in scientific notation. In this case, it's going to save you a lot of space in two different ways. Way number one, this number is massive in terms of length, so it's definitely going to save it by not having to list all of the zeros. The other thing we're going to benefit from is there aren't nearly as many significant numbers because without a decimal, this number only has two. So when I choose my number between 1 and 10, I'm going to choose the number 2.2 times 10, and then see how many places to the right we move. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 2.2 times 10 to the 11th power. If we're going to look at this in uh, the opposite fashion, where we're looking at a decimal number, we could look at an example such as 0.8. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros, six, six, four, two. And again, the benefit to not expressing this in this fashion is, one, I get to shrink the number, and two, there's a high likelihood if I don't, I'm going to write down the wrong number of zeros and get something incorrect. So, first thing I have to do is choose a number between one and ten. That number, for me, gets to have four sig figs because all of these don't count. They're just placeholders. In a decimal, I don't start counting until I hit the first non-zero. So the number between one and 10 with four sig figs will be 6.642 times 10 to the, and then this way, we have a decimal. It'll be a negative exponent to the number of places moved to the left to reach the decimal. So here's where I put the decimal in, so it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places to get to the decimal, which means this will be a negative eight. Last but not least, if we looked at a number like point zero zero one one. It doesn't have to be a large number, and to be honest, I doubt I would change that into scientific notation. But if I wanted to, I get two sig figs because those first two zeros do not count. So my number would be 1.1 times 10 to the, here's my decimal that I put in, one, two, three places to get back, times 10 
to the negative third. So that's how it works if you're trying to take a number right, that is not in scientific notation and put it in scientific notation. If I'm trying to do the reverse, right, all we do is look at what we have. For instance, I'll just take one of each of these and try to convert it back. Let's say I have the number 2.76 times 10 to the fifth and 3.48 3, 5 times 10 to the negative 6. If I wanted to change these back to their original form, all I would do right, is look at the number of sig figs in the number and then move the decimal either to the right or the left, the number of the exponent. So if I look at this number here, 2.76 has three sig figs. So it'll be 2, 7, 6. Here is where the decimal currently is. So to get where my new number is going to be, right, I look at the exponent, which is a 5, and because it's positive, that means I have to move it to make it a large number. So we're going to move 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right, so this is where the number will now end, and with these empty places, you have to put zeros, which means this number would be 276. Thousand. Bottom one, 3.4835 times 10 to the negative 6. First, you look at sig figs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 sig figs. Then, it's a negative exponent, which means it's going to be a decimal. So we do the 3, 4, 8, 3, 5. Here's where the decimal is. Negative exponent means I'm moving to the left. And the 6 tells me it's 6 places. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 means I put my decimal there, and zeros fill in all of those places. So it ends up being 0.0000034835. You will find that we will do a significantly unbalanced ratio of these type to these type. We very rarely want to pull numbers out of scientific notation. We almost always want to put them in scientific notation or leave them in scientific notation. So I hope this gives you some good background on setting up conversions. Uh, hopefully you've watched this one before the conversions, but if not, it probably clarified some things. But as always, if you're having any trouble, please come in and get some help and we'll get you straightened out.